morning and welcome to the Learn to Paint series with Cheryl Ann Hills. Today we're going to be learning to paint waves and rocks. We did uh, one recently where we did uh, some rocks and some rapids. And this time we're going to do some rocks that are at the edge of a beach and the waves as they ebb and flow and crash. We're starting off today uh, being brave, actually. I'm not using a charcoal pencil this time to draw out my shapes. Instead, I'm using a little bit of the white titanium paint and a brush, and I'm starting to just draw in those shapes. Certainly, if this is a little too scary for you, you can go ahead and pick up your pencil, your charcoal pencil, whatever that you like to use to sketch it in, and uh, do it that way. As you see in our image, the rocks are kind of uh, squished down into that bottom right corner. Um, you don't need to follow those images that I send to you exactly. Um, if you want more rocks in your picture, definitely put more rocks in there. If you want more waves and bigger waves, then do bigger and more waves. This is your painting after all. You're the artist. You get to make the decisions. Because really that's what painting and making art is all about. It's making decisions as you go along. Deciding, do I put this line here? What shape should this be? What color should that be? Is this in shadow? Is this in light? It's constant making decisions which is probably why it's such a good activity for your brain because you're constantly making your brain work. And we've got the basic shapes of the rocks roughed in. Now I'm going to go through and just pick out a few highlights of the waves. As you know, this as something that I like to do, I like to decide ahead of time where the, the brighter areas are in my artwork. Some artists prefer to do all their shadows first, and other artists prefer to do all their midtones first. If you've ever watched my videos and other videos by other instructors, you'll learn that there's no one single way of doing this. There are lots of different ways to get to the result that you're looking for. The thing to remember is that you need to find a method that you enjoy and that works for you. And to be honest, that will change over time. The way I used to paint is not the way I paint now. I've changed. And I think it's because as human beings we change. We grow. Our likes and dislikes change. We move to a different city different country, we have different friends. All these things influence how we see the world around us. And how we see the world around us is what is reflected in our artwork. As you can see, I picked out some fairly bright areas over on that right hand side. I'm going to be using some of my walnut oil just to thin out the paint a little bit. I don't want it too heavy at this point. In the early stages you want your paint to be thinner and then as you progress the paint progressively gets thicker. As you know, I'm using oil paint, and so that is a technique that is pretty common in using oil paint. Starting off thin and working thicker as you go along. It's 
Certainly if you're using acrylic paint, some of these techniques will work for you. And if you've never tried oil, I encourage you to give it a try. Don't be afraid of oil. Oil is actually a lot of fun to play with. It's For me, it's like pushing and they talk about pushing and pulling paint on the surface. You don't understand that until you actually start playing with oil. With acrylic, it dries so quickly, it's really hard to push and pull that paint. Where when you've got oil paint, it takes a longer time to dry and you can go back into brush strokes that you already applied and push and pull that paint around. So right now I'm putting in the waves, the basic waves, the shapes, and as you can see in the background things are closer together, not so much detail, and as we get closer to the foreground things are larger, further apart, you see more detail. At this point we're going to start adding in some of the bulkiness of the waves. And I'm holding my brush a little bit differently today and the reason for that is I don't want to fall into doing everything heavily detailed and worrying about high realism or realism of any kind in this particular composition. What I want is something that's a little more loose in feel, more impressionistic. And so for me, the way I can achieve that best is to hold my brush loosely and in this particular way with it facing flat and that forces me to use larger brush strokes that are a little more vague and less detailed. I'm just moving some of that yellow around the composition right now. I've talked about this before. When you're introducing a color, let's see what I'm trying to do is get that triangle happening there. And that just helps move the eye around. And when we talk about moving the eye around, we're talking about how a viewer views an artwork. Your eye is attracted to things that are high contrast. So anywhere where you've got a very light area and a very dark area side by side, the eye is automatically attracted to that area. I'm going in right now with a pretty strong blue. I've uh, changed up the brush. And I'm going to add in some of those super darks right away. The advantage of using oil as well is that you can do this. You can add big blocks of paint and then go back in later and move it around. And because I've got white in there right beside that dark blue, anywhere my paintbrush touches the white when it's loaded with the blue, it's going to get a lighter tone. I encourage you when you're painting with oil paints to, to play around with different techniques and the way you hold your brush, different uh, colors that you might use.
Everyone tends to make the assumption that water is blue. It's not. Water is actually colorless. If you pour it into glass, there's no color to that water. What happens with water is it's a reflective surface, and it's going to pick up and reflect the colors that are around it. So when a large body of water under a bright blue sky, that water is going to reflect the color of the sky, and of course that's when it appears blue. It's also going to pick up colors from beneath the surface. The sand, if there's any sea kelp under there that makes it kind of a green. In sort of little microscopic organisms. All of those will affect the color of the water. In a storm, the water tends to look a little murky and muddy. That's because it's churning up all that soil and sand and soot from underneath. Often when you see paintings of a creek or a river and it's surrounded by trees, the water will look kind of a brownish green. And that's simply because the water is a little more shallow than a deep lake. And so you're seeing some of the mud from the bottom of the river. And then the water is also picking up the color from the trees that are around it. You know, painting water is it's challenging. But it's also very fun because it's a very free form. I'm just picking out waves, particular waves that I want to show. So the white cap is that whiter area and then underneath I'm putting the darker area with the blue to show the wave curling around. And here, as you can see, I just laid down a line of blue and now I'm actually pushing it up and pulling it through those white areas. So we've finished laying in some of the bigger and smaller waves. We've established a foreground and a background. And we're going to add in another color into the wave to give it a little bit of a greenish hue. And I've just added a tiny little bit of viridian green. I'm going to add that in to the edge of this foreground wave. And it starts to give it that little bit of a translucent green that you sometimes see in the deeper lakes. Viridian is... Uh, it's a very powerful color. A little bit pricey. You'll notice that a small tube of Viridian will tend to be twice the price of the same size tube of most of your other regular colors. But because it's such an intense pigment, you don't need a whole lot when you're working with it. 
It's a great color to use when you're doing water. I'm also adding in, I just added in, as you can see here, the same green in the mid-ground. I'm going to add it in to at least one more spot. I like to do three spots at least if I'm adding in something new. So now I want to add a little bit more of that yellow into this area. And of course we all know that yellow and blue mixed together give you that green. Just want to intensify that area a little bit. I know one of the mistakes I sometimes do and have done mostly in the past and lately I've been learning more that it's better to be bold and that is to be too timid about colors. If you're going to put in a dark, then put in a dark. Make it like a super duper dark. Give it some intensity and power. And if you're going to add in a nice brilliant light color, I like to use yellows as my brilliant highlights, then make sure it is a very brilliant color. Some of my work in the past it was just too subtle. A lot of people didn't see what I was seeing. And so I've learned to make things bolder, almost exaggerated. kind of softening out that foreground water Adding in a little bit more of the white. So I have some spaces um, with the pink showing through, which is okay. You don't need to cover your canvas fully. You can let that background grounding color come through. I used to think it just showed that you were being careless and it was a big mistake when you did things like that. And then I went to the McMichael Museum and I went up to one of Tom Thompson's, a few of Tom Thompson's works and looked really closely. And you know, there was quite a bit of canvas showing through. 
he wasn't concerned about all that technical stuff. He was more concerned about capturing the moment. And that really encouraged me to set aside some of these little stresses and worries that I had when I was painting and just focus on creating that form, creating that feeling. The feeling that I'm putting through in this particular piece today is the beginnings of a, a storm coming in and how the waves start to churn and push against the rocks. They haven't been whipped into a frenzy at this point. They're just becoming more active. Things are starting to churn. You can almost feel the wind pushing against you as you stand there staring down in the water. Now I'm using a brush to do the white caps in this particular piece. You can, uh, if you've watched uh, some of my other water ones, I've used uh, the palette knife. You could use a palette knife as well. I like to change it up. I like to challenge myself. I find the palette knife to do the waves is just, a, it's very easy to get that effect. Using a brush is a lot more difficult. just kind of dotting along. At this point the paint is very thick as you can see where we've already got the thin layers underneath and now we're working with the thick layers on top. And it's important when you're layering wet on wet in an oil painting, if you want that upper layer to maintain its color and form, you really need to thicken up that paint. Of course, your other option is to set it aside for a few days, let it dry, and then do your next layer. I like to practice the wet-on-wet -wet technique even when I'm in the studio because when you're out doing plein air painting outdoors, you don't have the luxury of waiting for the paint to dry. And yes, I could. I could use acrylic paint when I paint outdoors, but then I wouldn't have all the fun opportunities that oil paint gives me. Just using a very light touch at this point. And making decisions as I go along. Do I want this to stand out? Do I want this to be in the background? If you want things to look further away, of course you blur them out. You make them less detailed and lighter in color. Things that you want to bring forward should be more brilliant, more intense color larger shapes, more detail. I know I talk about this a lot in my work and in my workshops. So it's simply because it's a question I get a lot from my students when they come here into the studio to do classes. Always stand back, take a look at your work. Sometimes when you're standing up too close, you lose sight of what it really is.
So now I'm going back in with this small flat brush and I've mixed in some Prussian blue and I've added a bit of the burnt umber to it to darken it down and I'm just intensifying some of the darker areas that I want to come out in the work. So that little wave there where it's curling, I did the under bit with the darker area. This one here too, now I'm going to go in. The wave is curling down and usually right underneath that wave is the darkest area because there's no light there. Put that in and then, like I said, the it intensifies that area now because I've got a super dark beside a super light and right away the eye is attracted to that area. So it becomes a focal point in your composition. Often artists will say this is the fun part because we're going in and we're refining little bits and pieces just to bring out the shapes and forms that we want to show in the work. Point, I've got that larger brush and I've started to blend that back area of that wave. Just to give it a little more translucent look. And then softening down my background. I want it to appear, I want it to appear much further away. So I'm taking out any of the unnecessary detail that's in there and just softening it right down. I'm holding my brush in this funny angle again. Again, because I don't want to get caught up in the details. So I'm going to start working on the rocks. I've got a combination of the cadmium red and white with some burnt umber. There's lots of different ways to do rocks. Again, if you watch some of my other workshops, I show a technique using palette knife. 
which is a really fun way to get that rustic look of the rocks along the water's edge. This time I decided to use a brush again. This rock here in the foreground I already know is much too light. We'll be darkening that up as we progress. So we're going in with some dark, which is mostly the raw umber mixed with the Prussian blue. Just to lay in where we want those shadows to be. Make sure that these rocks do have a distinct color from the waves that we did earlier. But I don't want them to be such a stark difference that now I've divided my canvas in half with a reddish brown rock on the right hand side and the bluish green waves on the left hand side. are going to reflect some of the same colors in the waves. appearance to your rock. But it's not such an intense red that it takes over the entire composition. I'm considering where the light is. And the light is basically coming from that top left corner. So anything that's away from that light source, I want to paint that in shadow. And I don't use black. If you ever truly observe nature and what's around you, shadows are not black. Shadows are the same color as the object but with less light and so you take the same color that you use to paint that rock and you add a little bit of your raw umber your brown and that will mute down and darken down your color 
If you want a really cool shadow, cold, as in cool, C-O-O-L, use your Prussian blue to darken down that color. Warmer shadows, you can add a little bit of red to the brown. I still want to go in and darken up some of these darker areas on the rocks. I feel it needs a little more shadow happening. But again, I'm trying to resist the temptation of being too overly fussy and worried about the little details. Because again, like we talked about, we want this to be a little bit more of an impressionistic style of art. So at this point I'm picking up the palette knife. I want to add in some texture that I can't get using the brush. So I'm just going back in again and I'm adding darker and darker, progressively darker and darker areas to these rocks just to kind of bring out the form a little more. So I'm stepping back periodically and I'm taking a look deciding where I want those extra shadows to go, where I want the extra highlights to go. When you get closer to the end you tend to slow down quite a bit on the composition.
So at this point, you kind of have to make a decision. You can keep going, or you can leave things. And I like the looseness of this, and so I'm finishing it off. I hope you enjoyed the workshop. It was uh, always great to do these for you. And uh, please check my website for more workshops every month. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.